Welcome to A Flame for Christ, homilies to set your heart on fire with love for Jesus Christ. My name is Father Joseph Gill, priest of the Diocese of Bridgeport, and you've joined us on this Corpus Christi Sunday. So one day a tightrope walker was performing a stunt where he walked a tightrope tight rope across Niagara Falls. Before beginning, he asked the crowd, do you believe that I can do this? And the crowd responded fervently, yes, we do. So he walked across and back to the wonderment of the crowd. He then lifted a wheelbarrow onto the tightrope and asked the crowd, do you believe that I can push this wheelbarrow across this tightrope? And they unanimously shouted, yes, we believe you can do it. And he replied, well, great. Now, who wants to get into the wheelbarrow? You know, faith is not just an intellectual exercise, right? Faith means living as if all this were true. We got to get into the wheelbarrow, as it were. And one of the most challenging things is to, in our faith is to believe in the real presence of Jesus Christ in the Eucharist because it does go against what we experience with our five senses, right? To our eyes and ears and, and to our tongue, it just simply seems like bread. But our faith tells us it's something deeper. In fact, we believe it because Christ himself said it, because the church has always believed it, and because Eucharistic miracles have reminded us of his true presence. So if we believe he's truly present in the Eucharist, though, how must this truth change our life? How do we not only believe it intellectually, but actually allow it to penetrate our deeds and our actions? I want to mention four ways in which we can live Eucharistic lives, all of which conveniently start with P, so you can remember them. The first one, presence, presence. You know, as Woody Allen once said, 80% of life is just showing up. And this is especially true with the Mass. You know, it's the truth that we can encounter God anywhere, but it's only here at Mass that he's really, truly, substantially present in the Holy Eucharist. I think during COVID, we all learned the lesson that there's really no substitution to just being in someone's present presence, live and in person. I mean, all of the Zoom meetings in the world just can't come close to that. You know, when the COVID lockdown happened, someone suggested that I did youth group via Zoom. Oh, Lord, no, please, please, no. Right? And it's just something deeply satisfying to the soul to be in the presence of others. And so, yeah, you know, praying at home or on the golf course or watching Mass online, it's okay, but it falls far, far short of the deep spiritual hunger to have a real physical, physical, tangible encounter with our Eucharistic Lord. That's why our Lord gave us that commandment to keep holy the Lord's day because he knows that we need it. He knows that that's what our hearts yearn for and hunger for. Now, one may say, well, but life's so busy. You know, we got to be reasonable and practical, right? And sometimes we just can't make it to Mass. But God asks us to live by faith, not by things that are practical and reasonable, right? Consider the context of today's first reading. The Israelites on the journey through the desert were kind of concerned because their food was running low and they're like, ooh, we've got a lot of desert to get through. And so they made the very reasonable and practical decision to return to Egypt, where they had just been freed from slavery. So Moses, however, was begging them to keep moving through the desert. He said, look, I, I, if you only trust God, he's going to show his faithfulness. And lo and behold, God gave them this miraculous food in the desert, the food of manna, which is this bread from literally from heaven that was provided every single day for 40 years. And so then God makes the point to the Israelites, man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, right? Man doesn't live by perhaps your practical and reasonable excuses, Rather, you live by faith, saying, if I put God first, if I trust in his faithfulness, if I come to the Mass and receive that true bread from heaven, then he's going to make everything else in my life fall into place, right? So when we put the first things first, we've got to trust that God is actually going to keep everything else in its proper order. Yeah, we may think we have no time for Mass because we've got to work or take our kids to our sports games or sleep in, but it's really in God that we're going to find the right ordering of our life. Right? And every Sunday, he wants to bring us that joy of being in his physical presence. Okay, so first, presence. Second, passion. Passion. Are we enthusiastic about the Eucharist? Do we look forward to going to Mass, or is it just something we do out of obligation? Or worse yet, if we just dread going to Mass? And once in seminary, I was complaining to a brother seminarian, oh yeah, I gotta go to Mass later today. And he responded, you don't have to go to Mass, you get to go to Mass. It's an honor. It's like, ooh, yeah, you're right. In many sacristies, which is the room in the church where the priest vests for Mass, there's a sign that says, Priest of God, celebrate this Mass as if it were your first Mass, your last Mass, your only Mass. 
That's a sobering thought, right? If this was your last Mass before you died and met Jesus Christ, would you attend it with passion? Would, be, would you be grateful to be here? If you ever go over to Ireland, you'll notice that some, in some places, especially in rural Ireland, you'll find two gigantic rocks, sometimes six feet tall or more, standing upright with a very small six-inch slit between them. And these were called mass rocks, because during the time that the English were oppressing the Catholics in Ireland, mass was outlawed and had to be celebrated in secret. And priests used to celebrate mass on rock altars at night behind the wall of the mass rocks. And Holy Communion was passed to the communicants through that gap in the rocks so that the priest could stay hidden. Because if the people didn't know the identity of the priest, they wouldn't betray his identity if they were tortured or questioned. Despite the danger of going to Mass, the Irish treasured these beautiful, daring Masses. And even to this day, there are countries where attending Mass is punishable by death. But people still go, because they realize this is far more than an obligation, but a real encounter with the risen Lord. Do we realize that we're coming to the banquet feast of the Lamb, the foretaste of heaven, the front row seat to the sacrifice of Calvary, an entryway into the throne room of the King of all creation? We should approach the Holy Eucharist with such passion, knowing who it is that we come to receive. So first, presence. Second, passion. Third, purity. Did you know that St. Francis of Assisi only received Holy Communion three times in his life? He was so in awe of the gift, and he realized that he was unworthy. Now, I don't recommend his example because our Lord wants us to, re- to receive more frequently, but I do recommend his sentiment. You know, I think if you've, ever, if you've ever been to a jeweler's shop, you'll see how everything is so meticulously clean because they know that there are valuable items there within, and if it gets dusty, you could lose them or they would lose their luster, right? And likewise, our souls must be cleansed in confession before becoming the dwelling place of the God of the universe, and of course, we particularly need confession before communion if we're conscious of a mortal sin, such as missing mass or a sin of drunkenness or impurity or holding true hatred in our hearts. So first, presence at mass. Second, passion, enthusiasm for the Eucharist, love for him. Third, purity, approaching him with pure souls. And fourth, prayer. You know, Jesus says in today's gospel that he gives us the Eucharist so that we can remain in him and he remains in us. And he literally does remain in us. You know, if, if um, St. Philip Neri ever caught someone leaving Mass early, the saint used to send two altar servers with lit candles after them because he recognized that when a person received the Eucharist, they become literally a living tabernacle. For 15 minutes after you have sacramentally received Christ, he is physically present in your stomach. That's kind of mind-boggling, right? What a beautiful time to speak your heart to him when he literally dwells inches away from your heart. You know, there's once a great saint, I forget who it was, who wanted to live a Eucharistic life. And so she would receive Holy Communion on Sunday and then spend Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday in Thanksgiving and then spend Thursday, Friday, and Saturday in preparation. So every single week was this constant routine of Thanksgiving and preparation for the Holy Eucharist. That is living a life in intimate union with Jesus' Eucharistic heart. My friends, what a gift we have in the Holy Eucharist. Our belief should then translate into the way in which we live, being in his presence every week at Mass, hungering for him with passion, living purity in our souls, and remaining united to him through prayer. Our only eternity gives us enough time to praise him for such a gift as the Holy Eucharist. <laughs>